Hi friends, I'm Gio, and welcome to my channel. Today's story is called Boy Toy. The little noises that you're hearing right now. My little dog is eating. She loves her kibbles. She's a little noisy too, but anyway, let's get started. Saturday, October 15th. Are you Chad's sister or something? I asked, as the woman led me into their living room. Chad and I had been intimate several times in this room. Something was different this time. It had pictures and a family portrait on the wall above the brown leather sofa. Chad could afford the finer things in life. He worked in a high-end jewelry store called Brancusi's, located just off the strip. It catered to the ultra-rich and ultra-famous like Tomas Blake. Rumor says that's where he bought his boyfriend, Kobe, his wedding ring, and Scarlett bought a neck chain for his boyfriend. The place was very chic, very upper class, very out of my price range. The family portrait caught my eye. Chad was in it, as was a woman and a little girl. A horrible feeling sunk into my stomach. I'm a friend, she said. Who are you, and why are you here? I blabbed like I was a scared student in front of the principal back in middle school. I'm Caleb, Chad's boyfriend, and today is our six-month anniversary. I figured I'd surprise him, bring him flowers and tickets to the play, Tuxedo Island. We'd been talking about it. Your turn. Who are you? The woman looked at the flowers and the slim package with the tickets in it, and frowned. Have a seat and tell me everything. How did you meet? Have you moved in together? I took a seat on the leather couch and tried not to blush with memories of the last time I'd been on that couch. We've talked about sharing a place, but Chad travels a lot and sometimes I work crazy hours. We spend a few weekends together, usually at my place, sometimes here, and he left some clothes in my place, I said. How long have you been dating, she asked. She seemed cold and nervous and my gut told me something was wrong. I chatted and observed, trying to figure out what my subconscious was upset about. She wore a wedding ring. Pictures of her and Chad were everywhere, including one with her in a wedding gown, standing next to Chad. Oh, shit. Mid-sentence, I blurted out, Is Chad married? Are you his wife? She nodded and began crying. I sat there, stunned. The flowers dropped to the floor. I had been the affair partner without even knowing it. Is this what scum felt like? Because I felt slimy and dirty and a sick horror shot up and down my spine. I whispered, trying not to cry as well. I didn't know. Chad never wore a wedding ring. He said he was single. I should have seen the signs. I'm sorry. I understand, but right now I hate you, she said, gulping the words out. Stand in line, because I hate me too, I said. The front door opened. Chad stood there, looking at his wife, then me, then back to his wife. All color drained from his face. He focused on me and yelled, what are you doing here? Having a little chat with the wife you never told me about? Don't call. Don't text, don't write, don't contact me, ever. I yelled at my cheating ex-boyfriend as I pushed past him out the door. I couldn't decide if I was more disgusted at him or at me. Probably at me. I've never felt so used. Six months later, Thursday, April 27th. This was annoying. I walked out of my file room and took a seat at my desk. A woman in a crisp red business suit and black pumps and a black Fendi handbag waited for me in my office. She had blonde hair with blonder highlights and green eyes that must be colored contacts. On her wrist was a diamond cuff bracelet with a clear sparkling gem set in a swirl pattern in 14 karat gold. If that was real, it would be worth six figures. They had to be synthetic diamonds because nobody in their right or left minds would wear something so expensive in this neighborhood. Everything about her screamed fake. 
Her perfect nails matched her business suit, but also screamed pasted it on. Her smooth skin suggested plastic surgery. She wore hair extensions that almost matched her original hair. It didn't help that her carefully applied makeup seemed too careful. She must be about 35 or 40, trying to look 20. Can someone say rich? Snob? Something about her made me distrust her. Something about her reminded me of that lying sack of crap ex-boyfriend of mine. I haven't had a relationship of any kind since. I haven't even dated. I've seen a therapist a few times. His last name is Cuervo. His first name is Jose. And the first sip always burns. At least he's honest. And affordable. And dependable. I can't believe I agreed to listen to the client. This particular client. Melanie Fulger. I can't believe someone dripping with money would sit in my cheap-ass office. I bet if I looked out of my fifth-story window, I'd see her Porsche or whatever she drove with her bodyguard around it. I took a seat and straightened my tie and politely asked, Coffee? She gave me a prim smile and waved my offer away. Let's get down to business. I gave her a practiced smile and said, Just so you know, I'll be recording our meeting so I can refer to the details later. That's fine. I need a letter delivered to my husband, Lars Fulker, and it needs to happen quickly, she said. And for some reason you can't let the post office deliver it? I asked. He doesn't have a stable address. At least none I know of, she said. Why me? I asked. You handled the Gregerson affair a few months ago and was discreet about it. Reeser Gregerson is a friend of mine, she said. She handed me an envelope containing several pages of information and pictures, several hundred dollars, and a key. Among the pages were unsigned divorce papers. Among the pictures were several of him. Surprise. She likes her men young. Very young. I'd guess 22 or 23. Stylish brown hair with highlights, blue eyes, and designer glasses. Probably nearsighted. The two of them were at some function at one of the casinos. She looked happy. He did not. He wore a light blue polo, a slim silver chain around his neck, and an uneasy smile. A college kid trapped with a woman old enough to be his mother. She was using him as an arm piece. Had he realized it yet? I raised my eyebrows at Melanie. This is all the contact information I have on him. The money should be enough to cover your fee. If not, let me know and I'll send you more. And the key is to our old apartment. I sold the place, and the new owners want to begin remodeling it next Monday. They also changed the locks and want everything out. Ergo, he needs the new key. I've never heard of a realtor working this fast, I said. It's a prime location, and the deal has been in the works for the last month. They offered a $10,000 bonus if we leave by next Monday. Tell Lars that he has two days to get his stuff before it goes in the trash. He can leave the signed divorce papers on the counter. Doesn't an eviction notice require a 30-day notice? I asked. Lars evicted himself a couple of weeks ago, she said. Oh, I said. The story is not relevant to your job. Find Lars, deliver the key on the divorce papers, take your payment, and move on to your next job, she said. My mind played with several scenarios, and the most obvious one came to mind. Somebody cheated, didn't they? You or him? Melanie gave me a small, frowning smile and slightly humped. I gave her a similar frowning smile. He didn't take you stepping out very well and left. It sounds like you and me have the same luck with relationships. Sooner or later, they all head south. I walked over to my mini-fridge, next to the door that led to my file room, and pulled out a couple of colas. I handed one to her, and opened mine before I said, To the south. Somehow, we survived. We toasted. We both drank. What if I paid you double your daily rate, and included a bonus if you dropped everything so you can focus on this one case? Could you contact him tonight? She asked. I sat back in my chair and took another long sip. 
There's more going on. You're not telling me something. Why do you want to find Lars so bad? That's a private matter, she said. Look, lady, I've heard the story a million times. You weren't getting a need met in your relationship. You found a guy who met that need. You hankied the panky. When your boyfriend found out, he dumped you and left town. Now he's ghosting you. You don't know how many variations of that story I've investigated. And you're lucky there's no kids and property involved. So, I'll ask again. What's so important? Or is there a secret kid and property? No, child. We were smart about that. But my grandmother is dying. There will be a substantial inheritance. I want the divorce finalized so Lars has no chance to take half, she said. I nodded and set my cola down. She set hers down as well. I said, Money talks. Okay, I'll find him. Next question. How am I supposed to find him? I've included a list of places he frequents. I want you to find him, deliver the envelope, and text me when you have it done. No more questions, Melanie said, standing up. In case you're wondering, I'm Caleb Baxter. Guess what I do for a living? I search through your garbage and sit in odd locations taking pictures to verify your significant other suspicions about you dancing the horizontal two-step with somebody besides your significant other. I'm also very bitter. My last relationship ended ugly. Turned out Chad's money solved life's inconvenient problems and a diamond necklace put him back in good graces with his wife. The trip to Tahiti didn't hurt either. Melanie reminded me of him. Same attitude that money solves everything and I bet she thought that she was better than God or peanut butter cups. Entitled snobs give me indigestion. I remained distant and professional as I said goodbye. Then I opened my desk drawer and had a peanut butter cup to celebrate my new case. I don't eat them the regular way. I try to eat off all the chocolate before I eat the peanut butter. At least this was an easy case. Find somebody. At least I could pay next month's rent. Before I did anything, I poured the cola out of her can and carefully wrapped it in a Ziploc bag, then dated it, timed it, and included the location. I took pictures as well. Since my last relationship fell apart, I'm paranoid. Helps that I worked at the crime lab for a couple of years before becoming a private investigator. I read through Melanie's list. It had about 20 places, like bars and restaurants and even a movie theater. How did she know all these places? A list like this meant she had been following him. A jealous woman shadowing his every movements? Not with her being the cheater. A tracker on his car? Possible, but that would take some subterfuge. A tracking app on his phone? I could name a half dozen off the top of my head. Which meant she already knew Lars' location and didn't want to tell me or admit to it. Why didn't she deliver the key herself? Was she planning something? I'm too suspicious sometimes. It kept me out of trouble, except six months ago. My car is a dusty 13-year-old blue Chevy Impala with tinted windows. Nobody ever noticed it, and nobody wanted to seal something that old. It ran great, but got okay mileage. The best part about it was that it was paid for. The worst part was it had trouble starting. Every day, I prayed it would start because I barely had money for rent. I had another case I was working on. It required a camera with a high zoom lens. I spent an hour waiting outside some office building. Then, as the target exited, I took a couple of photos, especially of the woman he was walking with. Somebody would get served divorce papers in a couple of weeks. I made notes of time and place and packed up. Time to hit Melanie's list. One thing most of the places had in common they were out-of-the-way places where a man went to think or meet somebody. Maybe Melanie wasn't the only person having an affair. I started at the top of the list, a bar called South. He wasn't there. He wasn't at a strip bar called Jam Jam Club. I bet Melanie didn't know it was a gay club. Was Lars gay or bi? 
His car wasn't anywhere close to the next place, a diner called the Burger Bar, nor the park near Washington Avenue, nor another neon club called Starburst. It catered to college kids. Going straight down the list seemed like a waste of time. If Melanie was tracking Lars, then she wanted me to waste time. Why? I skipped to the end of the list. It was about eight when I found his car. The place was called Sylvia's, and I'd been there a couple of times. It was decorated with wooden bead wall hangings and olive green walls and, and odd masks from all over the world, and it was both a pizza parlor and a bar. Some said it was the best pizza in Vegas, because they only made Chicago deep dish, and they had their own brew. Three Sisters Dark Ale. Odd name, great beer. It was a full-bodied brew with a hint of honey and something I could never identify. Drinking a pint always reminded me of that fantasy movie series that came out decades ago. The one with the wizard and the magic ring. I always made the out-of-the-way trip to buy a six-pack if I was trying to impress somebody. The atmosphere was cozy and warm and the bartender had silver hair and a name tag that said Sylvia. She was the owner and a casual friend. Lars sat in a booth near the back, nursing his beer and by the empties on his table. He'd been here a while. I nodded at Sylvia, and she poured me a brew of their house special. I took a seat next to Lars, closed my eyes, and sipped pure heaven, a full, rich taste with a hint of honey and something else. Lars looked at me, an odd grimace about his face. At a guess, definitely twenty-two, probably college student. His hair was longer than in the picture, and mostly combed. His unshaven stubble was scruffy and short, and I'd guess five days old. He adjusted his glasses a little to view me better. His clothes were rumpled as if he slept in them. I looked at him and placed the key in the envelope with the divorce papers on the table. We don't know each other, but I think you have a problem. Melanie hired me to give this to you, and based on her detailed itinerary, well, I need to see your phone. What? No, he said. Your wife is tracking you somehow, I said, and showed him the paper she'd given me. He took one look and handed me his phone. It was nice, new, and made my phone look like it came from the 19th century. In my line of work, we use all kinds of tools. I've even subscribed to hard-to-get tracking apps that masquerade as bank logins with hidden passcode protection. Melanie didn't have access to those. I only had to look for five minutes before I found the app, a cheap one that barely showed GPS. I showed Lars. How long have you been split? I asked. Two weeks. When I learned she cheated on me, again, I grabbed some clothes and left. The furniture we bought together, the dishes, the jewelry, I don't want any of it. Do you have a place to stay? I asked. He gave a very depressed smile and said, my parents didn't like her, and if I married her, I wasn't allowed back. I'm too ashamed to even call my friends and tell them what happened. Me and Waldo live in my car because I can't afford to go anywhere. Waldo? I asked. My dog. She's a two-year-old miniature bull terrier, Lars said. What do you plan on doing? I asked. Honestly, I wish I could go backpacking across Europe for six months, he said, staring depressedly into his beer. What about your job? I asked. He actually smiled. I can work wherever there is a Wi-Fi connection. You got a back room? I'll pay rent. Then he just laughed. Not the humorous kind, but the kind when life has thrown you into the gutter and is getting ready to do it again. I guess Lars thought it was a joke, but his idea actually kind of worked for me. I could use help with the bills. It probably wouldn't be for very long. I took a long sip of my brew. Still, I knew nothing about him, except I didn't like the woman he was married to. Sure, I said. Fifty-fifty utilities and rent. I figure out how to deactivate the tracking app on your phone, and we leave your car here until I have a friend check it over for bugs. Lars gave me one strange stare and took the papers. He signed the divorce papers immediately, tucked them back into the envelope, along with the key. Deal. I'm an okay cook. A decent handyman, and I use headphones most of the time, so I won't disturb you. I'll make sure you don't regret this. 
Do you know a place where we can mail this right now? You don't want to go back and pick anything up? I asked. She can keep it all. Everything in that place will slow me down when I go backpacking. Because once this is over, I am leaving the country. I figure I'll start in England and work my way around from there. I'll stay with you for six months, or as soon as the divorce is finalized. Know any good lawyers? Lars said, standing up. He wore khaki shorts that showed off his muscular legs. Lars must be a runner because those legs had great definition. Two words came to mind. Nice legs. Though I didn't say it out loud. We shook hands. I disabled the app, and we went to an all-night FedEx. Late night overnight shipping can be a little expensive. I tucked the receipt in my pocket. Sue me. I collect receipts. My place was a two-bedroom dump. I spend so much time working I never clean up. And the little bit of time I do have for cleaning, I prefer binge-watching some random show. It's not the Ritz, but you can crash here, I said. As I unlocked the front door, I cleared the unfolded wash off the couch, pushed a few things over on the counter to make room for a suitcase, and said, Welcome home. Lars smiled and said, I'd take the city dump over living with Melanie. Your place is way nicer than my car. Welcome to the city dump, I said, with a lopsided grin. I had a couple of beers in the fridge, and I handed him one. I saved the colas for clients. Waldo explored, going from kitchen to bedroom and finally camped out on a pile of dirty laundry. He'd make a better investigator than me. His handwriting is probably nicer. Friday, April 28th. That morning, I called an old work buddy from the crime lab who had helped me out on a couple of cases. He towed Lars' car and took Lars's phone. He took Melanie's can of cola with him. While Lars watched, I texted Melanie. Target found and package delivered last night. I dropped Lars off at a lawyer. Then he caught a bus to the university, and I went to shadow another broken couple. Seriously, if people knew that more than half of all the relations out there end because of cheating, they'd think again about ignoring prenups. Maybe take a second thought about marriage. I got a text from my friend. Because of the backlog, it would take him three days to take care of things. Before I picked up Lars... I bought him a burner phone. Those are cheap phones with forgettable phone numbers used by either people without a lot of cash or only plan on using them a couple of times. At least Lars had something to use. We got back to my place, and while I was taking a shower, Lars surprised me. In the ten minutes, okay, it was more than that, I got a shower and cleaned up. Lars had made a ham, onion, and mushroom pizza, plus garlic bread. I could fall in love with this guy just for his cooking alone. It didn't hurt that he was cute. We ate, talked, and spent a few minutes cleaning up. Threw his clothes into the washer and then binge watched some sci-fi series. It was fun. I missed having a boyfriend. But after one went down, I still felt sleazy. Better to be alone. Saturday, April 29th. The second day Lars spent with me, we went to Coffee Coffee, a nearby coffee shop. Then I dropped him off at the university. I called my friend at the crime lab, and he updated me. This might have started as a basic find-a-person case, but it was difficult to stay objective. Maybe I had been alone too long, but I was developing feelings for Lars. It's unprofessional to be romantically involved with somebody in the case. So I kept my feelings to myself. Besides, why would a college kid want to date somebody six years older and one with a damaged past as well? Short answer, he wouldn't. What's the phrase? Love from afar. Sunday, April 30th. Early afternoon, I woke from a nap to find Lars missing. Waldo had snuggled next to me, softly snoring. His warmth was comforting and, in its own way, healing. I got up, made coffee, and stood out on the deck. My car was in a parking spot just below, and Lars, shirtless and smudged with grease, was bent over the open hood, working on something. Something metallic groaned. Lars swore, suddenly shaking his hand. I took a second cup of coffee and walked downstairs to join him. What are you doing? Lars looked up. God, was he sexy. 
He sucked on his bleeding finger. Your battery is shot, so I thought I'd replace it, but one of the bolts isn't cooperating. Do you want me to kiss your finger better? I flirted, then kicked myself. Lars didn't need a lovesick roommate drooling all over him, not one who's six years older and made a mess of his love life. I'm an idiot. I handed in the cup and together we worked on my old piece of crap car. It took an hour, but the old Chevy started on the first try. We made dinner together, ate dinner together, watched TV together, and laughed together. The point is, we did everything together. We had fun together. We broke out the three sisters' beers and we talked about everything. He told me about his time with Melanie before sitting forward and asked, You've stopped dating and have nobody in your life. What happened to make you so alone? I shouldn't have, but I did. I stared into my beer and said, The last guy I fell in love with turned out to be married and had an affair. He never told his wife or his affair partner. I was the affair partner. Lars was silent after that. Monday, May 1st. After I got home from spying on yet another cheating couple, and when Lars got home from the university, Lars worked on his homework. I researched my cases, especially his. Some inner sixth sense bothered me about Lars' situation, but I couldn't figure out why. Guts are like that. Poor, innocent college student picked up and married by a woman twenty years his senior, who pretended to be twenty years younger. Then she cheated on him. He left. She gave Lars a key and divorce papers. It seems straightforward, but something didn't add up. My gut was tingling. I kept digging. Tuesday, May 2nd. When I got home, the dining area was spotless and had two place settings set out, plus chopsticks. Lars had made a seafood stir-fry. You don't have to keep making food every night, but I'm glad you do, I said. It's my way of saying thanks, and don't think you're getting off easy. You got dishes, Lars said. As I was helping Lars set the food on the table, we bumped into each other. We were close. Too close. His breath was warm and smelled of something spicy. His lips were a finger's breadth away. He smelled of a faint cologne and a pine soap and a little of the stir-fry. Could I kiss him? I wanted to. No, I won't cross that line. The part of me that had been hurting for too long ached to be even closer. I wanted to hold him, hug him, feel him next to me. I didn't want to be lonely anymore. I didn't want to keep myself from others anymore. I didn't want this hurt anymore. I wanted somebody to love and love me. Forget that. This pain, this aloneness, was what I deserved. Chad had cheated on his wife with me, and I had never known. It didn't stop me feeling that I had betrayed his wife, and worst, myself. I didn't deserve someone as nice as Lars. Did I deserve anyone? Pulling away from Lars, I finished placing the food on the table. Wednesday, May 3rd, our sixth morning together. My friend at the crime lab called. Lars's car is ready. Bring him down. Detective Morris has a few questions. My gut kicked into overtime. I set the appropriate case file with my keys, wallet, and notepad. Knowing my luck, I might need this today. Right after breakfast, I gave Waldo a chew treat so he'd leave my socks alone. Lars and I went to my old job, the crime lab. The crime lab is a one-story building made of white brick and dark windows. If you didn't know what it was, it would look like just another office complex. Except this one had several police cars parked out front. We pulled into the parking lot, and for some reason, I expected to see Lars's car. It wasn't in the main parking lot. Behind the building, they have parking for cars involved in criminal incidents in a fenced-off region. Also in the rear where multiple garages for individual vehicles where lab workers can take their time to examine something. My friend waited for us by the door and walked with us through security, an odd grimness about his mouth. He handed me a couple of papers. One was a printout of everything on Lars's phone. 
The other was a detailed rundown of the tracking app they had found and removed. And the GPS tracker attached near the engine on Lars's car. We took a seat in one of the three lounges. It might look like a lounge. Couches and soft chairs and tables and mood lighting. A large flat screen was on one wall, but it didn't play anything. Even a cozy hardwood floor with a nice carpet in the middle. But I knew different. They had a dozen cameras on us, and the room was wired with microphones everywhere. Smile, you're on camera, and probably live-streamed and recorded. They could hear a mouse burp with this setup. Sometimes a cozy chat revealed more than a sterile interrogation. I guess the detective that wanted to talk to Lars wanted to be friendly. I can be friendly. My friend gestured to a couple of seats, and me and Lars took them. My friend took a chair near us, and we made small talk. A couple of detectives joined us. Morris and Hillerman. They asked some questions, and both of us answered them. It didn't get weird until they asked. What do you know about Mrs. Vulgar's jewelry? Detective Morris asked. Jewelry? Lars asked. Neither Lars nor I expected this. I sat back, taking a few notes. The part of my brain that was the most paranoid clicked in high gear. Lars glanced at me, then spoke pretty candidly. Melanie usually kept her bling in a safe in her closet. She loved wearing it when we went to parties. Can you describe it? Hillerman asked. Pearl necklace, some rings, a diamond bracelet, some kind of ugly necklace that looked like Cleopatra would wear it, and a bunch of other stuff. She was into that kind of stuff, Lars said. What would you value it at? Morris asked. I don't know. A few hundred, maybe a thousand. Some of it didn't even look good. Lars said. When was the last time you saw any of it? Detective Morris asked. Am I in trouble? Do I need a lawyer? Lars asked. You're not under arrest. We're only asking questions, Detective Hillerman said. Detective Morris leaned forward and leaned her elbows on the table. When we read you your rights, then you'll need a lawyer. Right now, we're trying to nail down a few details. Valentine's Day. She wore the bracelet, and she wore the pearls at one of her friend's wedding in March. She probably wore something for Easter, but I don't remember what, Lars said. Once you left, did you ever go back? Morris asked. No, I didn't want to see her again, or see that place, when Caleb brought me the key and the divorce papers. Well, I sent the key back with the divorce papers. Why? Lars asked. Do you remember what day? Morris asked. I pulled the receipt out of the file and handed it to them. Hillerman left a moment to make a copy and then brought the original back to us. Why all the fuss about the jewelry? I asked. Detective Morris glanced at Detective Hillerman before speaking. Her voice was completely deadpan. Mrs. Fulgers has accused her husband of taking her jewelry. She says she has video evidence, but she hasn't turned it over. Lars jumped up. That's a lie. I wouldn't touch that trash, and I haven't gone back in weeks. According to her, the bracelet alone is worth mid-six figures. She has the insurance evaluation to prove it, Morris said, and slid a paper across the table. The insurance evaluation of the diamond cuff bracelet. I looked at it, taking a few notes. Hillerman slid the other insurance evaluations for the rest of the jewelry on the table. Both Lars and I looked through them. Added together, it made almost five million dollars. Lars' hand shook as he pointed at a couple pieces he had seen her wear. Terror flooded in his eyes. I took more notes. Something clicked. I rifled through the papers in the folder. I turned to my friend. Were you able to get any usable fingerprints from the cola can? He nodded. Run them. I'll be back in an hour. If you would, tell Melanie to be here. Tell her you caught the thief, I said. I didn't steal anything, Lars said. Never said you did, I said. Where are you going, Lars said, a waver in his voice. I think what he meant to say was, don't leave me. I took hold of his hand and tried to give him strength. Answer the detective's questions and be truthful. I'm going to grab some bagels. 
Then I went out to my old car. It started right up. I had fun with Lars this last week, but I was older than he was, and my last relationship became a disaster. I wasn't even sure I wanted another relationship. I hadn't put myself out there, maybe because I was scared. After what happened, I didn't feel whole. I felt broken. I felt used. I felt undesirable. I felt unworthy to be loved. Who would even want to date me? Certainly not some cute college guy. No, the best I could hope for was to get Lars out of trouble so he could live his dream. And for that, I needed bagels and a few things from my office. Melanie had messed with the wrong P.I. I arrived back at the crime lab 90 minutes later and was ushered into the lounge. Melanie Volger was there. She was dressed in a flowing green blouse, tastefully covered with a flowering bonsai design, with slim fitting black slacks and black heels. She wore no jewelry and carried a St. Laurent handbag that matched her blouse. Lars was very pale, and the look in his eyes was like a puppy dog pleading to get adopted. He was almost yelling when he said, I did not take anything from the apartment. I do not steal. Play the tape again and lie some more. Where are my jewels? Melanie said. The big screen flickered, and a black and white image appeared. A bedroom, I guessed, with the camera focused on the closet. A slim figure in an oversized hoodie with hood pulled up and hiding the face and carrying a pillowcase, entered the room, went straight to the closet, opened it, knelt to the safe, opened that, and stuffed the pillowcase with the contents of the safe, including the diamond cuff bracelet. I'd lay odds that was Melanie. Arrest Lars. He knew about the safe and nobody else. Ask him how he got the combination. Ask him what he did with my jewelry, Melanie yelled. I didn't steal it. I don't even own a hoodie, Lars yelled. I took the chair next to Lars and placed the sack of bagels in front of him. I ripped it open, found one of the containers of cream cheese, and took the top off. Eat. Keep your strength up and let me handle this. Who are you? Melanie asked. You don't remember me? I'm the private investigator you hired to find Lars, and I don't appreciate being set up. I said, taking a bagel myself, slicing it in half, and smearing cream cheese on it. I took a bite and offered a bagel to Morris and one to Hillerman. Morris took the bagel and said, I assume you have something to add to our conversation? I walked over to the flat screen and its laptop and connected a thumb drive to its laptop. It took a second to find the exact few minutes, and then I let it play. It showed Mrs. Melanie Fulger in all her finery entering my office. I paused the video and zoomed in on her wrist, the one with the overly pretentious diamond cuff worth six figures. Exhibit A, I said. We know what that is, Melanie said. Please, no questions until the magic trick is done, I said. I picked up the insurance evaluation paper and held it beside the image on the flat screen. Of course they were identical. Exhibit B, please note they are the same, I said. Point noted, Morris said, leaning back in her chair. I played the original interview for about a minute, then paused it again. This time I focused on the key. Exhibit C, the key which Mrs. Fulger asked me to pass to Lars, I said. Hillerman leaned forward and took a few notes. I picked up the mailing receipt from the table and held it next to the image of the key. Exhibit D. Late night, overnight delivery. Those aren't cheap. Please note the time. About 8.30. And please note description of contents. Divorce papers and the key. Detective Morris leaned forward. Her eyes serious. Was it delivered? I pulled up the website on my phone, typed in the confirmation code, and held my phone up so everybody could see. Not only are they worth the money, 
but they are efficient. 8.17 in the morning, barely 12 hours later. Lars couldn't have used the key because he didn't have it, and he couldn't have driven to their apartment because his car was here at the crime lab getting inspected. I drove him everywhere. Where was Mr. Folger right after you mailed the key? Hillerman said. He and his dog stayed with me, I said. Those are lies. They faked it all somehow, Melanie shouted. What happened then? Lars asked. You're not going to like this, I started to say when Melanie jumped out of her seat. This meeting is pointless. You'll be hearing from my lawyer. I gave her a sharp stare and sternly said, Sit down, Mrs. Shirley Langerson. Or do you prefer Dorothy Peterson or Cheryl Lamb? Is any of those your real name? After the events of six months ago, I'm a little paranoid. When you came into my office, I gave you a can of cola. My friend ran it for fingerprints. What were the results? Mrs. Marcia Baxter, and she's wanted for questioning in a lot of incidents, my friend said. You've been tracking Lars' movements to get ready for this con. It's not just that, but with a bit of digging and some fun with social media, I believe that Melanie or Shirley or Dorothy or Cheryl or Marcia, or whatever your name is, you're a grifter and con artist. She's been pulling scams and raising money for her favorite charity for years. She's her favorite charity. She sets up the con, usually a long con, and leaves town the second it is over. Her favorite scam is the stolen jewelry for insurance money con. It's simple. She finds someone who is gullible. She marries them, then frames them for theft. Everybody assumes the jewelry is pawned and lost. The insurance company gives a big payout, and then Melanie or Shirley or whatever her name is disappears. Lars, you have company. She has two other husbands that I could find. You can't prove any of this, Melanie or Dorothy or Marcia or whatever her name said. I gave her a big smile. My proof might not hold up in court, but I think my friends at the crime lab would take what I've uncovered and make a present to the prosecuting attorney. That would hold up in court. I demand a lawyer right now, Melanie said. Do you have any theories as to the location of the jewelry, Detective Morris said? Not the apartment. Too obvious, and it would be searched. She'd need it close in case she had to make a fast getaway. I'd say a secret compartment in her Porsche. Am I right, Melanie or Dorothy or whatever you want to call yourself? I'm not saying anything without talking to my lawyer, Melanie, Dorothy, or Cheryl, or whatever her name was, said. That's okay. I have one other thing to say. Marrying multiple men without divorcing the previous ones is fraudulent. It also means that only the first one is considered valid. All others are null and void. Better than a divorce. Once the law confirms all of it, Lars is free of you. What were the divorce papers? An excuse for me to deliver the key so you could set him up? You were never planning on a divorce. Just skipping town and letting Lars take the fall, I said. Later that day, once Lars had given a statement and I had given my friend all my evidence, I sat on a bench in the shade, staring at the sky. A beautiful deep blue with high wisps of clouds. The best word to describe my mood was melancholic. Finally, Lars came outside, his shoulders sagging, but he had a lightness to the way he walked. He sat next to me. Can we pick up Chinese takeout on the way home? My soul felt so old and worn out. Melanie or Marcia or whoever she was reminded me of my ex, reminded me of my mistakes, reminded me that I was not worthy of the man sitting next to me. I was not worthy of love. What is it? Lars asked. I thought a minute before answering. You don't have to keep living with me. You're free. I'll only hold you back. What are you saying? Lars whispered, an odd look about his eyes. I'm saying that now that this is over, 
You can do a lot better than me. I'm six years older than you. I don't think I'd be good in a relationship anymore. I don't even know who to trust. In my world, it seems like everybody cheats. You're a good-looking, nice kid, a dreamer, somebody with a marvelous future ahead of you. The world is a wonder for you. But I can't be part of your life. I'm broken. I'm damaged. I'm tarnished and don't deserve love. I like you, Lars, but I'm not good for you. Find someone better. Lars leaned forward, his eyes moist, and his lips slightly parted. He whispered, I already found the best. When my friend came outside to hand Lars his car keys, we were kissing. The end. Thank you for listening, everybody. I appreciate it. Peace.